Hello everyone. If you're just joining us, welcome to MetaScience 2021 and to this symposium, which will be Do Replications Make a Difference? My name is Fallon and I will be moderating this session. We will have three speakers followed by, I understand, plenty of time for Q&A. So as we go, please do put your questions in the Q&A um, chat box and we will get to them at the end. And with that, I will hand over to our first speaker, um, Bob Reed. Over to you, Bob. Okay, am I, is my screen being shared here? I think so. Yes, you just need to go into presentation. We good? Yes. Okay. All right, so I'm Bob Reed um, from the University of Canterbury. I work with a research group called UC Meta. And um, this uh, paper I'm going to report on is, uh, um, is uh, written with my colleague, Tom Coupe, also at Canterbury. So um, the research question that we're going to be looking at in this study is, do negative replications affect the citations of an original study, uh, more so, say, than positive or neutral replications? So that's our research question. And to address this quantitatively, we're gonna to have to assemble four pieces. The first piece is uh, we have to have replications. And then the second piece is that these replications have to be assessed. Was it a positive replication? Was it a negative replication? So we need an objective um, assessment of the replications. The third piece is we have to match these replications to their original studies. And then the last piece of the puzzle, in some ways the most important piece, is we have to match control studies to those original studies. So um, that's really the, 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 the nuts and bolts or the guts of what we're doing is being able to have a good match. The way we're going to match is look at the citation histories of original studies compared to control studies. And if their citation histories match very closely, then we'll pair those studies up and then look at how their citations change after the replication study has been published. Okay, so we're focusing on citations. We're gonna match on the basis of citation histories. Okay, we're gonna assemble a, a sample, actually numerous samples, and they're gonna consist of three types of studies. We're gonna have original studies that had negative replications, original studies that had positive or mixed replications, and then we're gonna have the match controls. Okay, so, so that's the, the individual pieces of our um, statistical analysis that will become later on. Uh, we're gonna draw our replications from economics and from two sources, replication wiki and the replication network, both uh, of which post replication studies publicly, uh, and focus in the area of economics. All right, so I'm not gonna go through this, but how do we assess the studies? Well, basically we don't. Uh, we let the authors of the replication studies give us their assessment. And so uh, oftentimes in the abstract or the conclusion of a paper, the author of a replication study will say something like this. Um, you know, we present robustness and placebo tests that cast doubts on the validity of the original study. Or they might say, this study suggests that the results are very robust regarding blah, blah, blah. And so we let the replication study assess itself, so to speak, and we take that as our, um, as, uh, as our category of whether it's a positive or a negative replication. That's also the impression a reader would get when they read the paper. Most readers are gonna basically take the assessment of the author, uh, they might uh, investigate it some more, but that will be the, um, the impression they'll have of whether that replication was positive or negative. All right, now comes the tricky part of collecting control studies to match with our original studies. Well, the, the, the simple way is just go to the same journal or issue that the, controls, uh, the original study was published in and just grab all the other articles that appeared in the same journal or issue. If it's in the same journal or issue, it must have some commonality with the original study. So that's a natural place to look for control variables. 
but we're also going to cast a much wider net. We're going to look at all studies in Scopus that were published in the same year as the original study that were also published in the same area, the same very large general area, say economics or business or finance, and were also published in those journals that published the original study. So we have a collection of you know, several hundred journals that published uh, our original studies, and we're gonna choose our control variables from those very same journals. So we've got two, two places we're looking for controls. And in this first stage, right, we're just casting a big net. In this first stage, we're gonna end up with 422,918 potential controls and 225 potential originals, okay? Now that's stage one. What we wanna do in the next stage is narrow down those, those matches so we only choose ones that are very close. And that really is the core of our analysis. So there's two dimensions to finding good matches. First of all, um, studies differ in how much time has elapsed between when the original study was published and the replication study was published. It's gonna be a lot easier if I'm matching on citation histories to find a good match when there's only two years or three years of citation history to match on. Much harder to find a really good match when I have seven or eight or 10 or 15. And as you can see from this, um, from this histogram here, um, um, we have a wide variety, a wide range of years uh, that have elapsed between when the original and the replication study was published. Uh, we do restrict our choice of controls to have to have at least uh, three years between when the original was published and the replication was published. So that's the first dimension we gotta be concerned about. The second dimension is the total number of citations, right? So it can be pretty easy to match a control study if the original has you know, five or 10 citations. There's a lot of papers out there. But if our original has 500 or 1,000, it's gonna be pretty hard to find a really good match. So what we're gonna do is basically have a sliding scale that's going to be a little more relaxed when our original study has a lot of citations as measured at the time the replication study was published. Okay, so, so nuts and bolts very quickly. Here's an example of a original study that was replicated and the replication was published three years later. That gives us a citation history of two intervening years. And what we're gonna do is compare our potential controls to the original for each of those years and look at the absolute value of the difference. The absolute value of the difference in T equals minus one the year preceding when the replication was published and T equals minus two the years before. And we're gonna construct this variable called total absolute difference. That's the sum of the absolute values of the individual year differences between, in citations between the original and the control, okay? So we're gonna take all these uh, controls and match them up and we're gonna try and choose good ones. Um, here's, the, here's the same uh, example for a four-year gap, all right? So now I have three years of a citation history to work with, okay? We're gonna go ahead and for every original, every control, um, um, for every sample, of three year uh, intervening gap or four year intervening gap or so on, we're gonna construct this measure of total absolute difference. And you should be able to figure out that when total absolute difference equals zero, boom, we got a perfect match. So our control study has exactly the same number of citations in every single year as our original study does during the citation history, okay? but. We're, you know, that's a pretty high standard to meet. So we're gonna relax that a little bit. We're gonna relax it as a function of the total sites of the original study at the time the replication study was published. So again, I'll go back to that three year gap example. Um, the studies published in T equals zero, the original, the replication published T equals zero, the original T equals minus three. 
So I'm going to count up all those intervening years, count up citations during those intervening years um, before, right before the replication was published. Okay, and I'm going to have a sliding scale based on that number. All right, and at, we're going to compare the total absolute difference in the citation history with the sliding scale. I'm not going to go through the details of that, but I want to point out this one. Uh, PCT variable, that's percent. So the sliding scale is going to be a function of the percent of the total original site. So if the total original sites is a pretty small number, then uh, we're going to have a pretty tight band where we're going to allow the control studies to match with respect to uh, differences in citations. If the original study had a huge number of citations, then the band gets bigger, okay? And so rather than explain that formula, I'll give some examples. Okay, so when percent is zero, no matter how many sites the original study had at the time the replication was published, we are only going to include controls that in the entire citation history only differ by one citation from the original study. That's a really tight uh, criterion. When the percent is 10%, that gets relaxed. When the original study has a lot more citations, then we're gonna allow controls that have uh, differ by a larger amount in their um, number of citations during the citation history period. And likewise, when percent is 20%, uh, the gap gets a little bit larger, flat gets a little bit larger, okay? All right, so here we go. So um, what that means is, um, we have a large number of, of, uh, of uh, specialized samples, and we have different matching criteria, okay? And you can see, say, when there's a three-year gap, and I use the 0% matching criteria, I've got 34 treated, 34 original studies, 4,553 controls, okay? So I do that when I got a three-year gap, a four-year gap, a five-year gap, up to eight-year gap, we lump all the studies that have more than eight, we combine three to eight, and then I throw everything in there. Okay, so, so you can see, and I'm going to focus in the subsequent empirical analysis on this yellow highlighted row. I got 0% as my matching criteria, and I got 74 treated, 7,000 plus uh, controls. When I have 10%, I got 103 treated, and 7,500 plus controls. And when I have 20%, I got 140 treated, and over 11,000 controls, okay? So that, that when you do that, that that's our, our best way to try to control for any unobserved differences between our controls and the originals. Okay, how well do they match? Well, pretty good. Uh, you can see by the mean row that for the 0% and 10%, on average, the absolute total difference over the citation history is less than one citation. At the median value, the median absolute total difference is one citation over citation history for all three matching criteria. So for the most part, we do a pretty good job of getting matches, okay? All right, so now we get to our statistical analysis, right? The dependent variable is going to be the difference in citations between the original and the control. And we're going to regress that on a constant term and on a a dummy variable refute, which is going to take the value one when we have a negative replication and zero if it's um, a positive or mixed replication. Okay, that's the regression we're going to estimate. And we're going to estimate that for every single year in a window around the period when the replication study was published. So we'll take the immediately three years preceding the publication of the replication and the immediate three years after replication study was published, okay? And we're gonna do that for each of the individual samples. So samples that only have a three year difference between when the original was published and the replication was published, four years, five years, and so on, okay? Although I'm also gonna focus on this combined three to eight here. Here's our results. Um, this, is, this is about it <laughs> about at the end here. So first of all, let's look at the matching period. 
we would not expect that the outcome of a replication would affect the citations of, um, um, of uh, original studies in the, in the years preceding the publication of the replication. And what this number here in the red box is telling us, that is difference between our control studies and our um, original studies for studies that had negative replications compared to ones that had positive replications, okay? And so um, we would expect those numbers to all be very close to zero because the outcome of the replication was not known yet. So it should be an irrelevant extraneous uh, variable and all those estimates are insignificant. The units here are number of citations. So, um, uh, that number minus 0.168 is saying that studies, the original study um, had uh, minus 0.168 citations less than the um, uh, matched control study if the replication eventually ended up being negative, okay? And again, sometimes negative, sometimes positive. So that's what we would expect if we did a decent job matching. Now let's look at the post-replication period. Now the results of the replication study are known. And so let's look at those numbers, all right? So again, we've got three years following replication, replication, 0%, 10%, 20%, different matching criteria, different numbers of treated and controls in each of these samples. Positive numbers, right? Most of those estimates are positive. What does that mean? It means that when a replication was negative, the original study actually received more citations than the control studies did compared to studies that got positive or mixed replications. It's kind of the opposite of what you'd expect. However, before you make too much of that result, notice all these numbers are really small, right? They're all less than two. The units here are citations. To get a sense for how much of an of, of a effect this is, you can go back and compare that to the number of citations these studies had when the replication was studied, when it was published. If I add one or two extra citations to the number of citations the original studies had, that is a negligible effect. So the estimates are positive, they are small, and across the board, they are statistically insignificant, despite having a fairly large number of controls, although that's a little bit misleading. Um, but the bottom line here is um, we find virtually no impact on the citations of original studies that have negative replications compared to those that have positive or mixed. In other words, no evidence that negative replications affect citations. Thank you very much. So I'll stop my share and pass it on back to Fallon. Thank you, Bob. Um, I, I do see we have questions, but I believe we've um, decided to hold all questions to the end of the three talks. Um, so we will move on to our next speaker, who is Tom Coupe. Um, Tom, if you can start sharing screen. Um, Tom's talk is titled Paving the Road to Replications, Results of an Online Experiment. Over to you, okay. Tom. I shared it. I, do you see the screen? Yes, absolutely. All right, good. All right, indeed. So this is a joint work with Bob um, and also Christian Zimmerman, who is at the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. So um, as I assume already many people have um, said before me, um, there is a uh, lot of evidence that Lots of studies cannot be replicated. We have evidence for, um, for that from psychology, medicine, economics, management, nutrition science. So there's lots of evidence that many studies cannot be replicated. And many um, um, observers have argued that, well, this suggests there's a big role for replications, that in fact, many people should be doing replications and we should see many published replications. However, in practice, we see that very few few studies get replicated 
and very few researchers are doing replications. And so one, one can wonder, why is this the case? Right? And one possible argument there is that, in fact, there are few replications because um, replications receive less attention than original papers. So uh, from our study, kind of here we have uh, kind of we collected information on about on 320 pairs of replications and their original papers. And if we compare over a six month period, how many times uh, the web pages of a replication paper gets visited and compare that to how many times um, over a six months period um, original papers get visited, we see that original papers get about four times more visitors than uh, replication papers. Okay, so this is kind of visits in a, um, in a big um, archive of um, economics papers. So clearly there is much more interest, much more attention for original papers than for um, replications. So if you're a journal editor and you have to choose between an, um, an original paper or a replication paper, you probably say, okay, I'm going to publish the original paper because that's going to be leading to much more interest in our journal. It's going to lead to many more citations. Similarly, if you're a researcher, you might say, okay, if I have to think about doing a project that is a replication or I invest in original research, maybe it's a better idea to invest in original research as that is going to get more attention um, as, as that is uh, going to lead to more citations for me. So what can we do about it? So if, if, if indeed the reason is that we see so few replications because people are not kind of paying attention to replication as much as they pay attention to originals. What, how can we change this? Well, a number of uh, uh, proposals have been made on how to improve that and how to get more citations for replications. For example, in 2015, Kaufman and Niederle suggest that, well, journals, they should require that whenever somebody cites an original paper, they should also cite the replication of that original paper. Okay. If the journals require this, we will see a, 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 a strong increase in citations for replications. This might give more incentive um, for um, authors to do replications. Kind of what we have been trying to do in our paper here is to do something uh, different. We, we have tried to see whether providing information about the existence of a replication can lead to more attention for that replication. So the idea here is being that, um, Okay, many people know about the original paper. They don't know about the, um, the, about the replication and that's why they don't cite the replication. Okay. So that, if, if that is true, then indeed we would see that the original papers are much more cited than the replication papers, just because nobody knows about the replication papers. So what we did is we did an, an intervention experiment. So we teamed up with uh, REPEC, which is a, a big archive of economics uh, working papers and economics journal articles, which is run by our quarter, Christian Zimmerman. Um, kind of, I think it's kind of probably the, the, the biggest archive. It has about three and a half million uh, um, research items uh, from over 5,000 working paper series and over 3,600 journals. Okay. So when you go to that website, when you try to find economics research uh, from REPEC, you will get things like this. So this is the, typical web page for a random paper. So kind of you search for replications, uh, or no, you search for um, articles that uh, are about replication, you search in, in REPEC, um, you find an article like this one on the need for replication, or for a replication journal. You get information about um, the abstract, the authors, whether it's downloadable or not, and so on. Um, you might see here some um, uh, blue and red tabs. Of, um, Repic is using this kind of course to draw attention to specific things you can do on that website. So now what we did is for papers that were replicated, we added two things. We first indicated under the um, title that the paper had been replicated. So we, we added a star behind the title and indicate that the star means, in fact, this paper is not just a random paper, it's a paper that has been replicated. Moreover, we added a yellow tab. Again, we made it yellow, different from the existing colors, again, to draw attention to that 
um, to the fact that the paper has been replicated. Now, if people saw that the paper had been replicated and they were interested in the replication, they would um, click on that yellow tab. This would bring them a link to the replication paper. Okay? So basically, people who didn't know there was a replication, by going to this website, they would find out there is a replication. And if they're interested in it, they could go to the paper through this link, right? Now, what we did is we made this an experiment. Um, as I said, we had, around, had about 320 different pairs of replications and originals. And we randomized which of those 326 pairs would receive this kind of information and which would remain as before, like without link, without explicit link, without a yellow tab or um, a star, okay? So how did we do the randomization? Uh, we didn't do it entirely random. We stratified it, kind of, we wanted to make sure that uh, we had a, a balance. We didn't, um, so what we did is we looked at six months of visits to these pages. Um, and then try to find uh, pairs of replications and originals that had in these six months similar visits to the, no the similar numbers of visits to the replication and to the original. Yeah. So what we want to do is we want to try to get um, controls and treatments that on average uh, are have the same number of visits to the originals and the same number of visits to the replications. Um, so we have divided in one group, in two groups, group one and group two. So you can see group one had about um, 10 visits in a six month period before we started the experiment. Um, group two didn't immediately get, uh, didn't, didn't get treated right away. Group one is the treatment group. Group two is under this, the group that originally serves as a control. So they don't get the yellow tab. And you see before the treatment started, we have similar numbers in terms of visits to the replications um, for the two groups and visits, visits to the originals for the two groups, which basically suggests that indeed before the treatment, we make sure there is a that we have a balanced sample and we can compare at least on average the treatment group and the control group. So now let's see the results of our intervention. The first thing we can do is we can measure how many people clicked on the link to the replication paper. So we have somebody visiting an original, then we count of all these people who visited this original, how many people then went to this replication and actually clicked on the, clicked on the link to the replication. So we actually can see how many people used our link. What do we see here in this graph? Here we have the share, the y-axis, we have the share of visitors to the original study that used our link. Um, before the we, we, or we started our experiment um, somewhere in August 2020, um, we don't know exactly when the link was created. It was somewhere in, in that month. So we only use data from the period after that. Uh, we see there were some people using links from the original to the replication before. It could happen because um, Rapac also has citation um, lists and that allows people to go from an original to a replication. But we can see this is very, very rare before we actually put the yellow tab there. Then um, in August, we put the yellow tab there, create this extra visibility for a link to the replication paper. The group that got the link, the treatment group, we see about one to 2% of the people who visit the original then go to the replication. In the control group, almost nobody. So we can see a clear effect of our intervention. By highlighting the fact that there is a replication, we can see that some people use that to go to the replication. Um, then in March, we um, extended our treatment to also the control group. So from March, all papers, all replica replication papers and all original papers that have replication in REPAC, are, they are getting such a, a yellow button. And we see again, one to 2% of the people actually are using this tab. Now, this is the share of people that click on the original 
relative to how many people visit the original. Now, since many pe more people visit the original than the replication, increasing the, the um, kind of a small share of visitors of the original that go to the replication can mean a bigger impact on the views for the replication. Right? So here, that's exactly also what we see. If we look at the share of clicks relative to the number of visits to the replication uh, web page, it's about, well, it varies from one month to another month, goes between four and 12%. On average, it's about 6%. From the moment we see, uh, from the moment we have the treatment, we see it for the treatment group. If we um, then extend the treatment also to the control group, we also see it, see it in the control group. It's clearly our intervention has an effect, but that effect is fairly small. A one to 2% uh, um, click-through rate. For if you look at original papers, this leads to an increase of five, six percent of visits to um, the original, uh, to the replication. We can also um, look at the overall page visits for the replications and compare the control and the treatment group. What we see there is again, after we do the intervention, we always have more visitors to the replication studies that were treated compared to those that were not treated. But the difference is very, very small. Okay. We also do some econometric analysis. Basically, this difference is not significant. So what does this mean? Well, kind of our original idea was that some people might not cite replications simply because they're not aware of it. So we wanted to see how does increasing awareness about the existence of a replication affect the visitors of original studies. And we see, in fact, the impact is very, very small. Kind of 1% to 2% of the visitors of original papers then go to the replication paper, leading to somewhat of a, an increase, 3 to 7% of visits to um, replication papers. So the big question here is, why do we observe this? Why do we have such small effects? One could argue that while we, we didn't provide enough information, um, maybe we shouldn't have just the yellow tab. Maybe we'd, we would have to have some pop-up window. But um, kind of, we thought that would be too annoying, and Repack didn't really want to want to go to that um, level of annoyance of visitors of their website. So uh, still, we think this is a very visible way of indicating there is a replication. So. We don't think that that's going to um, be a, a big ex that, that 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 can explain our our sm small effect sizes. Um, one could argue that in fact people already knew about it, but if people already knew about the replication, kind of why do we so see such big difference in visitor statistics for replication and originals? So, our kind of our um, feeling is that it's it suggests that kind of the researchers don't really care about replications, right? So even if they know that there is a replication, they still don't go to that replication and find out more about the replication. So that's the question. Maybe it's consistent with what Bob was presenting in the first presentation, kind of after um, a replication, the citations of the originals are not really affected. Well, one possible reason is that indeed people just ignore replications. Okay, that's all I have to say. So I will stop sharing now so we can do the next presentation. Thank you, Tom. That was um, an excellent way to, an open question to leave that we can come back to in Q&A, hopefully. So uh, we will move on to our third and final speaker in this session. Um, and that is Rose O'Day, who will be presenting um, a talk titled Feasibility of Replication Studies in Behavioral Ecology. Over to you, Rose. Uh, thanks, Valen. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks very much for sticking around to the end of this session, especially on a Saturday. Uh, to start, I need to acknowledge that what I'm presenting is very much a work in progress. We're actually less than halfway through the data collection. And I want to thank Megan Head for doing most of the work so far. If you would like more information about this project that we might not get to today, you can read the registered methods by following this link on the screen or just send me an email. Okay, so those previous talks were asking, do replications make a difference? 
But in behavioral ecology, we just can't answer that because we don't have enough close replications. And this is true of ecology and evolution more generally. The estimate from Clint Kelly is that fewer than 0.02% of papers in ecology and evolutionary biology describe themselves as replication studies. Now, this meta-science audience by now is very familiar with this general phenomenon and whatever discipline you come from, you've probably got your own literature of papers saying replications matter and we should have more of them. And what does a replication even mean? So this is just some of those papers from ecology and evolution over the past 20 years. Basically, there's been a lot of talk, but not much action. So why aren't ecologists replicating more? It's not that they don't think replications are important. They do, we know they do. Hannah Fraser conducted this survey, which found that ecologists think replications are important and we should be doing more of them. And then if you say, well, why don't we? Uh, the first thing people will point to is the incentives. So the difficulty is funding or publishing replications. People also talk about logistical constraints, environmental variability, and just the academic culture. But as we know, we've just heard, there are lots of ideas for how to overcome those barriers and encourage replications. So one day, Megan and I were talking about our frustration that although we have all these ideas, not much seems to change. And we thought, well, maybe it will help if we had some database of studies that are worth replicating. And then behavioral ecologists who were replication sympathetic could search that database and uh, find studies that they were capable of replicating. But how would you go about choosing studies to include in this database? Um, so my thinking on this has been heavily influenced by this preprint led by Peter Isiger. Uh, I recommend checking out this preprint. There's also a talk on YouTube. And it presents this model of how, if you had a candidate list of studies that you might wish to replicate, how would you prioritize them? Which are the most important? Uh, and basically what I took away from this is that there are four factors to consider. The first is how valuable is this knowledge that we're seeking to generate? Does this thing matter? The second is how certain are we in that knowledge already? If we're already sure that something is true or false, then uh, there's no point replicating it. That would just be a waste of time. Relatedly, what is the ability of this particular study to affect our level of certainty in that, in that knowledge? And I think this gets to a couple of things. The first is, what is the quality of that study? If it's poorly designed, if it doesn't measure what it's trying to measure, then whether or not it replicates uh, shouldn't actually change our level of certainty in that knowledge area. But I also think this gets to the culture of the research community. And this is what that previous talk was about. So would the community pay attention to the outcomes of the replications? And would they update their beliefs um, based on those outcomes? Then fourth, is this replication feasible? If it's going to be super expensive to do a replication, then it better be worth it. Now, out of this list of four things, I think that the feasibility question is the easiest one to think about and to imagine measuring. Uh, so this is where Megan and I have started uh, sort of attacking the low, lowest hanging fruit first. So that's the um, subject of today's presentation. How feasible are close replications in behavioral ecology? Now, I mean this as the discipline, but also more specifically, Behavioral Ecology, the journal. Uh, we're planning to uh, submit this to the journal Behavioral Ecology. So we're using its own papers as a case study to um, illustrate how we could possibly do these feasibility assessments. Now, this is a well-respected society journal that's been around since 1990. And we aim to sample across that 30 year span of the journal. And we have made the decision to focus on the more cited papers assuming that those are the papers the community has paid more attention to and therefore will be more likely to want to replicate or pay attention to the outcomes of those replications. So on this slide, I'm showing you histograms of the number of papers in each of those publication years with the citations per year on the X axis. And we've sampled from the top 25% cited papers in each year, which is shown by the red bars. Now, from those papers, we then screened them to only include the primary empirical studies. So we were excluding reviews, theoretical papers, those sorts of things. And then of the eligible papers, we just took a random sample in each year to end up with our database. And I should say from the year 2021, there were no citations yet. So we just took a random sample of those most recent papers. Okay, so now we have this database of 100 papers and we're uh, going through them to pull out the basic methodological details and assessing their replication feasibility. Uh, so, so far we've done 35 of those papers 
And this is just showing you the spread of those publication years for the sample that I'm showing you today. Now, each of these papers presented the results from up to five studies that we can estimate replication feasibility for. So overall, what I'm showing you represents 62 studies. Now, to do these uh, feasibility assessments, uh, Megan pulled out basic information from each of these studies, including short descriptions of what was done and why, what the main variables that were measured, and what were the limiting resources. So if you were going to do a replication, what about it seems like the hardest part? as well as what was the focal species and where were those species sourced from? So this slide is showing you photos of the species that are represented by those studies so far. Now, most of these are fairly common species that multiple behavioral ecologists could have access to. You might notice there are a lot of birds. Behavioral ecologists love birds. Um, this is a well-known taxonomic bias in the species that we tend to study. And there are also geographic biases. So. Um, here, the country shaded in dark are the locations where those species have been sourced from in those studies. As well as recording how common the study system was, uh, Megan also recorded where the data were collected. So was it in the lab or wild or semi-wild setting? Whether the study was experimental or observational? Whether you would be able to collect the data at any time or if it needed to be in a particular season? And how many people you would need to collect the data either full-time or part-time? So most of the studies had fairly small sample sizes, although there were some big exceptions from long-term studies. And the amount of time it would take to collect all the data was also usually fairly short, uh, so fewer than six weeks. If you already had access to the study system, um, then you could also start collecting data fairly quickly within six weeks. But if you need to establish the system, such as building the animal facilities, or uh, finding your field population or uh, getting ethics permits, then it would take a few more months at least. Okay, so those are the basic details about each study that Megan recorded. And next we set out to estimate the feasibility of replications um, on these four different dimensions. So system, intensity, duration, and complexity. We use sort of a, a traffic light system, uh, there's four, so a four point scale for each of those um, facets of feasibility. And we did these uh, estimates separately. So Megan had read the method section of the papers as she was creating this database, whereas I was just going off of that database um, of information that Megan had coded. So as I show you the results on the next slide, this is the color scheme I'll use. Uh, so remember the greenest color means that a replication would definitely be feasible, whereas the reddest color means that it would be really, really hard. First, I'm gonna show you our independent estimates side by side for each, each of these four dimensions. And then at the end, I'll put them all together with our consensus answers so you can have an overall picture of replication feasibility. Okay, first of all, how feasible would it be to replicate these study systems? So measure a similar population in similar conditions. Um, over 60% of the time we gave the same answer and uh, most systems seem fairly feasible to replicate. Second, how feasible is the intensity of the workload? So could you do this you know, on the side or would this require your, your full attention? And we're considering these things independently of each other. So this is not counting the intensity of say, setting up the system because we've already thought about that. This is just the intensity of once you've already got the system. And again, this had over 60% level of agreement. Third, how feasible would be uh, the duration of this replication study? Um, so would this just be a short project? Could a student do it or would it take years of your life? And this was the easiest, simplest thing to assess. We had uh, the highest level of agreement for this dimension over 80%. Fourth, how feasible would the complexity of the study be? So most studies had fairly simple designs with simple measurements and we had over 80% agreement again. Now, if you read the uh, registered methods for this project, you'll find that we'd also plan to assess a fifth aspect of replication feasibility, resources. Uh, how much extra funding would you require? But we found while doing these assessments, because we were trying to consider each of these aspects of feasibility independently, the resources category just didn't make sense. Because once you've already thought about the system, duration, intensity, complexity, that takes away the things that consume resources, the setup costs, people costs, equipment costs. And so we found that there just wasn't anything left over in this resources column and it, it didn't make sense. So we've decided to um, not, not score this for the remainder of the papers. 
Okay, so as well as finding out that this resource of column was weird, um, as we sat down together and compared our answers, we, we decided on the consensus answers for each of those studies for the aspects that we disagreed on. And this is what it looks like when you put all those um, consensus estimates together. So each of these rows represents one of those 62 studies. You can see by the amount of green and this lighter shade of yellow that most studies seem like they would be feasible for at least some behavioral ecologist to replicate. And uh, the, the hardest parts tend to be the intensity. So studies that have um, intense workloads or the duration, studies that require years and years of your, of your life. But this just answers one aspect of this uh, replication worth. If we're gonna prioritize studies for replication, then we do need answers to these remaining harder questions. If replication seems so feasible in behavioral ecology, why aren't we doing them? Is it that it doesn't actually matter whether this knowledge is, is true or not? I find this question of value just really hard to think about for a curiosity-driven field like behavioral ecology. Well, maybe it does matter if what we're studying is true, but it's too hard to work out what our level of certainty is. Or maybe we do know where the knowledge gaps are, but it's not obvious how any particular study affects our level of confidence in a particular knowledge area. And I think this is at least part of it. You see, when we were planning this project, we originally thought that we would also assess the feasibility of conceptual replications. So those are um, re replications that assess the same concept or idea, but in a different way. We quickly gave up on that idea, though, because it was just too hard to pin down exactly what any specific study was testing. We couldn't define its conceptual boundaries. This is not a new observation, and it's certainly not unique to behavioral ecology. Um, I'm thinking of these general meta-science topics of the crisis of theory and the crisis of generality. I think this also gets to this general problem that often what seems most important is the hardest to measure that not everything that can be counted counts and not everything that counts can be counted. And I don't know what to do about this. So in this presentation, I showed you a way that we can count the feasibility of replications in behavioral ecology, but I don't know how to count what those studies are worth. Still, I come back to thinking, well, behavioral ecologists at one point decided that these studies were worth enough to publish in the first place. So if it's quick and cheap and easy to replicate them, why aren't we? Thanks for listening. Uh, I'd be keen to hear your thoughts. Thank you very much. And so now I think we have about 10 minutes for Q&A. And I believe that Shinichi had a question because he raised his hand quite early. Shinichi, I'm just going to allow you to talk so answer your question, or so you can ask your question. Yes. Hello? Yes. Um, sorry, sorry, I actually raised hand accidentally. I was listening on my phone, but uh, um, the Okay, I'll ask question to Rose. Um, so the, it's really interesting that like, you know, that we don't know the uh, value of the, you know, how important it is. But I, I was thinking like, maybe many of those, I was wondering whether you are think, thought about um, assessing replicability because maybe easy one, there's a, you know, psychology and all other, uh, different uh, disciplines are doing like, what is, a, you know, uh, predictability, uh, how we can predict the replicability and uh, we are quite good at doing this. So maybe if it's easy to do, we first also wants to like, you know, the quantify the replicability of these uh, potential studies. Yeah, I guess that was part of the idea of the project is that at the end we'd end up with with a database of, of studies that that are feasible for people to replicate. So that could be a catalyst for some sort of um, replication project. Although I think we'd we'd want to think about whether that was that was the best use of time and resources, which those other talks were sort of getting to. If if we do these replications, will, will it change anything? Um, so I think 
I, I think we've got to think a bit more carefully before diving headfirst into a big replication project. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I just gonna, if it's okay, I'm gonna ask the question to everybody. Why don't people care about replication? That was sort of like, you know, the theme of all the you guys talked about. Why, why do you think that is? Because I do care. That's an excellent question, Shinichi, and actually one I was going to pose to all three of you as my question, um, just your own personal reflection. So um, who would like to take it away? I'll go ahead and jump in, let's get it started. So um, short answer, don't know. I suspect most people really don't care that much, but that's a personal bias. Um, uh, I gave a lightning talk on this earlier on saying we should ask people, um, you know, you get all these people who cite the original study uh, and don't cite the replication. We should ask them, why didn't you cite the replication study? You know, you're obviously were interested enough to cite the original. Uh, maybe get some information that way. But um, um, yeah, so maybe it's possible, Shinichi, that you and me and the rest of us are a little weird in that uh, we think replications are really important and most people don't. Tom? Um, maybe some, something similar that kind of when you cite a paper, uh, you cite it because it was a, an, or kind of it was something new, something that stood out um, maybe more than because you believe it's true. So in that sense, maybe we don't, we don't really kind of, when we cite, we don't really care whether we believe it or not. Rose, would you like to add anything? I just see Spionis just added something. Um, it, I, I think I, I covered it at the end of my talk and I don't want to say anything too defaminatory because this is being a, a recorded, but I can't. I, I worry about what it means if we don't care about replications. I worry about what it means for the quality of the science we're producing and our, our values and, and aims. Um, yeah. Fiona's just um, said that she was reminded of Stephen Goodman's talk at the last Meta Science Conference, where he talked about how we had lost the language to talk about uncertainty because of over-reliance on dichotomous significance testing. And she's wondering if there's a parallel here. We've spent so long out of practice in replication that we don't really know what to do with it now. And that sort of follows on from the talk that she, um, the question that she put in the chat, um, asking whether the softer question is, do researchers know what to do with replication evidence? And I'm wondering if each of you would like to reflect on that. maybe that's part of it kind of when i read these replications i also often don't really know what to do with it that kind of often replications they don't replicate everything they replicate only a part then the conclusion is not always too clear so with many replications indeed it's hard to kind of uh, hard to know how you should up update your beliefs after reading the replication yeah i agree So I guess the only thing I would say to that, I think it's really hard to know how to process a, um, a negative replication for the reasons that you guys mentioned earlier. But I think there's a lot of value in a positive replication. So if you go in with the prior that, hey, I don't really believe, you know, I don't know what to believe. And some guy did a study and somebody independently comes around and confirms that study. Uh, maybe two other people confirm that study. Well, then my, my priors are updated a lot. I have a lot more confidence in that result. So I think while it's hard to process conflicting replications, there's a lot of value in confirming replications. And I'm, uh, which is kind of a shame because I think journals, at least the, the uh, anecdotal um, um, evidence is that journals prefer to have negative replications because that's what people pay attention to and read. Well, it has, it has been a very interesting session and I'm wondering if there are any more questions. If not, I'm conscious that most of our audience uh, are on a Saturday in um, Australia, New Zealand. So we might leave it there unless you have any final concluding remarks that either of you would like to make. So I'm this gonna say one more, 
I say one more thing? Absolutely. So this is Rose. <laughs> Uh, um, Rose, there's a journal in finance called Critical Finance Review, and the editor puts out replication studies that he wants to see replicated, or original studies he wants to see replicated. Maybe if you could get an editor like a behavioral ecology to put out a list there, uh, A, it would, it would communicate to people that, hey, this editor is interested in this, they're likely to publish it, and that kind of solves the issue of how do we choose one? Because the editor says, do this, and I'm interested in publishing it. Does it work? Oh, it's a, it's a highly ranked journal. It's, it's, a, it's a really interesting journal. I could talk about it for a while. But no, it's a highly ranked journal. It's relatively new, kind of catapulted to the rankings because the guy who is the editor is a very idiot, eccentric and really smart guy and uh, has very influential in the field. Interesting. Thanks. I spoke to soon. There is one more question. Uh, it's for Rose from Eden. In addition to the lack of interest in replications when they are feasible, I'm interested to know about how to think about those studies where replication isn't feasible. For instance, what alternatives are or should be used for assessing credibility when replications aren't feasible? Oh, thanks, Eden. I think for those those long term studies where they don't seem feasible because they would take years and years to set up, um, you, you can kind of consider them as, as internal replications, so that if you can you can see the replicability of, of effects, um, you know, five, ten, fifteen years later. And I think those are, are really valuable studies in ecology and evolution to study um, all sorts of you know context dependent of effects and and and. Um, there's, uh, yeah, in interestingly, a lot of those populations, long-term studies first get established because they got lucky initially that they had some cool effects show up so that, you know, got them more grant funding, but then those effects disappear down the line. Um, and for those ones that are just a lot of work, it's not that they're not feasible to replicate, but they would require additional funding. So I think that more gets into the, um, uh, whether whether we care enough about replicating them enough that funders are going to give you money for that to be your full time thing and not just a side project, um, but for the question of uh, what what else can we do? I mean, we have we have computational reproducibility and um, conceptual replications. If we can define our, our concepts um, precisely enough or have strong enough theory that it makes sense to do those and interpret them. With that, I think we are genuinely at time. Just a reminder to everybody that uh, with this panel, we are concluding what has been a fantastic and robust Friday night, Saturday morning, MetaScience 2021 session. There is um, at the end of each session, a scheduled 30 minute networking component um, on Remo. I have popped those details and the link to Remo in chat. Um, you can go there to continue all of these conversations. Um, if you are missing the link, um, it's also on the MetaScience um, 2021 website and in all the emails that you've received. So there's nothing left except to say thank you again to, to all you. of our speakers and um, thank you for joining us. Thanks.